Hello and welcome to Bristol Ideas. I'm Andrew Kelly. One of the aims of our Festival of the Future City, which is back this October, is to look at cities of the past and cities of the imagination. Salman Rushdie's new book tells the story of the legendary Indian city Vijayanagar, or Bisnaga, Victory City, as it's more commonly known in the book, and also tells the story of the remarkable Pampa Campana, who provides the seeds for the city, literally, and sees its rise and fall over more than two centuries. I've always been a supporter of freedom of thought and freedom of expression. I was in Bradford and saw the satanic verses being burned on the street. Seeing this strengthened what I believe in, and it was this belief and commitment that led me to set up Festival of Ideas 18 years ago. It was an honour, many years after this, to interview Salman on stage in Bristol in our festival. We hoped then that the relative freedom he enjoyed would continue, but the murder attempt showed the threat is always there. I very much hope that we will be able to welcome Salman Rushdie back to Bristol and we wish him well in his recovery. To discuss Victory City, I'm joined by writer and commentator Sean Norris, whose Bodies Under Siege, How the Far-Right Attack on Reproductive Rights Went Global, is out in June. Barrister Susie Allegre, author of Freedom to Think, Protecting a Fundamental Human Right in the Digital Age. And Darren Anderson, whose books include Victory City, a tour of dream cities, nightmare cities, and everywhere in between. An inventory, a family portrait of Derry's troubled past. Both Freedom to Think and Imaginary Cities have featured as books of the year in the Financial Times. Let's start with cities. The city at the heart of this book, Bisnaga, is in some ways an ideal city. It's based on a real and tolerant place in the southwest region of India. Sean, could I start with you? A woman literally seeded the city. Her vision for the city is modern, no longer anti-art against women or hostile towards sexual diversity and embracing poetry, liberty, women and joy, as Rushdie writes. You've worked with us on women and cities. What did you take from this book? So I think that's one of the most interesting things. It's, it's that kind of idea of what could a city be? How can we imagine a city when it is designed for women and by women? I mean, we've spoken a lot about this in Festival of Future Cities. What do cities look like when they have women at their heart? And we often talk about issues like accessibility. You know, women's cities are often focused more on how women make journeys around the place rather than thinking about a car that takes you from A to B. We think about journeys that might be on foot or on buses or on trains or that accommodate women taking buggies or other caring responsibilities. And of course, we also think about how a city designed for and by women would focus on protecting women from gender-based violence and harassment and the abuse that all women live with every day as they traverse the cities that they live in. So I think one of the really interesting aspects of this novel is how at the beginning, when she imagines the city, when she creates the city and seeds it, these are the values that she's taking forward with her. Obviously, we're not talking about buses and buggies. This is set in the, the very, very distant past. But thinking about what it would mean to live in a city that values the kind of nurturing and creative qualities, that thinks about poetry and art and diversity and tolerance. And then, of course, what that means when that is taken away. So, so much of the book seems to me about almost a backlash against these kind of values of freedom, poetry, culture, creativity, nurturing. And this is a backlash that we're always seeing around the world when women gain some rights, when women gain some status, when women gain some freedoms, we see this kind of regression against those freedoms. And it feels to me like the book is often a kind of fight in the space of the city between what it means to be free, what it means to be a free woman or a free society, and what it means when those freedoms are taken away or repressed. Thanks, Sean. We'll come back to some of these points, I'm sure, through, through the discussion. Darren, this is based on a real city, but it's also a work of the imagination. How does this fit into the literature of imaginary cities? Well, I think it's um, by its very nature a sort of unique proposition. And I think at, at the heart of this book is uh, is a question of autonomy uh, for you know the citizens and um, and the inventor of the city. Um, but the uniqueness is is interesting in itself. So. There's a wonderful scene at the beginning of the book where the book literally grows from these seeds, and it's a, it's you know it puts the the magic into magic realism, and uh, but from that from that wonderful organic beginning, you you get the sense that this is a city of kind of flux and change 
and um, it really appeals to the power of those things, you know, in good ways and, and bad ways. Um, nothing stays the same for very long. Everything's complex and layered and there's all these sort of variables constantly happening. So in, in terms of its place in, in, in the literature of imaginary cities, I think it's um, it's sort of uniquely amorphous in a way. Um, it does have a certain overlap with books like um, Calvino's um, Invisible Cities and uh, Jan Morris's Have, which which they have it at their center. They have this incredible thematics, all these different themes that you know you move through: desire, mortality, memory, uh, contingency, simultaneity, all these things. But at their heart, there's there's this idea of getting back to the 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 real. They're really about just one place, and it's often the place where, you know, in the case of Calvino, it's Venice. Um, in the case of Jan Morris, it's probably all the different cities that she visited over a long career. Uh, so there's always the sense of this using the imaginary to tell the real. Uh, and very often, whenever the real can't be told, the, you know, in direct terms where there's a, a threat to that. Uh, so I, I see this book as very much the, the style is the message and the message is the style and vice versa. I mean, the two of the books which sprung to my mind as I read them were the ones you've mentioned, the, the Calvino book and the, the Jan Morris book. Absolutely. It's it's that, um, well, it, it's it's almost like in science fiction, you have this idea that uh, the stories are about the future, but really they're always about the present. And I think with, uh, in the case of Rushdie's, the, the fantastical is always a way of, of articulating the real, you know, um, also another quality I like about it is it's the the principle of uncertainty is really fascinating in this book. You know that nothing is ever taken for granted. Everything is subject to change, and the moment that they get a foothold, you know, for good or ill, it immediately starts. There's a dialectic. It immediately starts coming under pressure, and and the passage of time. Obviously, the lead character lives for a long period of time, uh, and is subject to seeing all these layers not just in spatial terms but in, in, in time terms um, and that's a quality that you don't find in a, in a lot of literature about imaginary cities you know that that sort of wide angle lens that he has also it's a very personal tale you, you definitely get the sense that this is a book that's come from the woman in his life and uh, it's a testament to them and a testament to the woman of India but I, I get this impression and I know from from hearing some of his recent interviews, that it's a kind of romantic tale of an, a North Indian looking at the South of India as this place that is simultaneously familiar, but incredibly enchanting and alien. And that's, I think that's something that we can, no matter where you are in the world, you can kind of relate to. It's always the, the next door neighbor is always simultaneously hostile, but kind of fascinating at the same time. Thanks, Darren. Susie, the city changes a lot in the book, but at certain times it has a very strong tradition and commitment to tolerance. What lessons can we take from this book, do you think, about the importance of tolerance in cities? Well, I think it's fascinating as, as you go through. One of the things that really struck me at the beginning of the book was this idea of Pampa Campana effectively whispering to all of these newly seeded beings in her city and effectively whispering this message of tolerance and creativity and art and you know, feminism, equality. Um, and so the idea that literally everyone in the city comes from this beginning, and yet still it doesn't stay, still things change, still even she uh, and her family have to leave, I think is really interesting. And that sort of message, though, that, that tolerance does come back that these things come in waves and that it's not a question of giving up it is a question of of keeping the faith if you like but also that you know one person or one doctrine is never going to last forever you're not going to be able to seed something that will be a continuum that will last uh, forever and i think one of the things as well about the city and the way that the city develops is also how cities have neighborhoods, which is quite different from if you you know grow up in a village as I did and now living in London. One of the things I love about London is that London has so many different characters in its different neighborhoods. And you see that as well in Bisnaga, which effectively 
then allows for tolerance because partly everyone's together, but also everyone can find their own people. You know, you can find your community within the city. And I think that um, is really important. But as I say, this idea of the whispering to begin with, when I was reading it, I was sort of thinking, well, she's effectively brainwashing the entire city and where is this going to go? Um, and I think that the, in a way, what comes across is very much that idea that you can't do that. It's not going to last forever, but that you still shouldn't give up on promoting these ideas of tolerance and that that is where creativity and our human future essentially comes from. And in your book, you've written about the tradition of freedom of thought going way back to, to even well beyond the time that we're talking about here. Um, and there are lessons through history, aren't there, through this? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what I looked at, I mean, I think one of the earliest um, examples that I gave was looking at Socrates, uh, you know, who famously was made to take his own life because his words and his um, attempts to engage with the youth of, of Athens were perceived as a threat uh, to democracy. And even now, um, you know, there's an argument about whether or not he was effectively pushing fascism and intolerance or whether he was talking about freedom of thought. And the, the fact that he was put to death uh, may well be one of the reasons why we're still talking about him today, which also kind of shows the futility of trying to close down voices. And I think another um, example uh, that I used was J.S. Mill um, and his uh, book on liberty where he talks about the fact that freedom of expression was much more heavily censored and restricted uh, in continental Europe, in places like France, uh, for example, where you're much more likely to be arrested for something you might have written uh, or said, as Voltaire um, realised very quickly. But that in England, um, the opprobrium and restrictions of society and Victorian society in particular uh, in Mill's view, were as much of a curtailment on freedom of thought and freedom of expression as those really quite draconian laws in other countries. And I think that's interesting, you know, from a human rights perspective, and particularly today. And I suppose that, you know, the, the situation of Salman Rushdie himself as a demonstration of this is that, you know, on the one hand, when we look at freedom of expression from a human rights perspective, you may um, challenge laws that are hugely restrictive of freedom of expression, but there is also the big impact of the way society responds uh, to expression, whether that is through the threat of violence, um, as Salman Rushdie has so tragically uh, been exposed to, or whether it's just a sort of a negative feeling, a, an exclusion, if you like, and the fact that you won't be able to stay in your community if you continue to say uh, what you're what you're saying. But one of the things that I think is really important as well from, from the human rights perspective and that I've talked about in my work is that you know, freedom of expression as a human right does not protect hate speech. So you know, international human rights law instruments actively uh, prohibit hate speech, tell governments that they need to bring in laws to prevent um, advocacy of war, advocacy of racial hatred. So there are effectively these these limits that that kind of speech, speech that undermines other people's rights is not is not protected. Um, and that's as well what we see in Bisnaga, again, that the ideas of tolerance being lost are coming from the grassroots, if you like, while they may eventually um, tip over into the leadership and the governance of Bisnaga, there's something that sort of swells up um, in the community and swells up again through through preaching and preaching against tolerance, if you like. Thank you. And um, Sean, coming back to you, a couple of quick question, which is about Bristol. And um, one thing we've noticed in, in the last few months, really, is how significant roles now in Bristol are, are, are being, um, women are now employed in these roles, whether that's the new vice chancellor of the University of Bristol, the Bishop of Bristol, the High Sheriff, uh, and so on. And um, do you think having these leadership positions will help change a city? like Bristol? So I think there's something really important or many things that are really important to consider when we think about women in leadership roles. And they're sort of what I used to call um, feminist bodies versus feminist minds. So it's absolutely imperative that we have what we call symbolic representation. And this is when we see women in really high powered roles. I mean, if we're gonna sort of work within the systems that we have today and the way that power structures are created today, 
you know, it's really important that we see that women can occupy spaces of power, that can occupy spaces of influence. You know, for girls growing up to see that a woman can be prime minister, can be a president, can be a high ranking surgeon, can be a bishop. I mean, we all, you know, it's not that long ago is when women weren't allowed to be bishops at all. So symbolic representation is really important because we can't be what we can't see as the saying goes. But for actual real change to happen, we need what's called substantive representation. And this is when women occupy spaces of power that actually create change for other women and for you know, society as a whole. So, you know, it's, it's always these big arguments, like does real change happen if you have a bad woman in power? Well, actually, I think it's there's lots of bad men in power. <laughs> you know, it's that joke of we will know we have equality when women can be as bad as a mediocre white man. <laughs> but um, you do need to recognize that if we're going to achieve real change for women in society, we need to have women in places of power that are actively advocating for women's equality and women's liberation. And I think, again, this is something that's been really interesting in the kind of mainstreaming of feminism over the past couple of decades. When we look at the sort of 1997 labor women intake, which was absolutely transformative in terms of women's political power, the number of women in parliament doubled overnight on the 1st of May. And a lot of those women would not call themselves feminists because at that time, feminism was still seen as a bit of a dirty word. There was, you know, the sort of 90s backlash. But those women went into spaces in parliament. They went into the ministries and they acted and created uh, uh, policies that promoted women's equality. So for the first time, you had women in the transport ministry and that meant focus was on buses rather than just roads. You had women in sort of... Um, business um in you know business uh what's the word departments and they were creating policies around you know child care even the fact that one of the bars in parliament was turned into a crash because suddenly you needed women um needed spaces where their children could be looked after nowadays we have women who are much more comfortable in parliament calling themselves feminists because of this kind of revival of feminism, a much more um, open-minded look at women's politics, and yet they're not enacting those feminist policies. So this is where we have feminist bodies in the room, but not necessarily feminist minds. So I think in terms of Bristol, it's absolutely fantastic that we see these women in positions of power. And I think it's really important that women growing or girls growing up in Bristol can look around and say, yes, I can occupy these spaces. But if we're to see real substantive change for women in Bristol, we need to have those feminist minds in these in these positions of power. We need them to be enacting policies that actually support and help women. And I think the other issue to consider is where exactly does power still lie? You know, we can have these kind of prominent women, but if they're the sort of what we call the Smurfette syndrome, you know, the only women in a room full of men and aren't actually getting listened to, aren't getting their voices across, aren't getting these policies across, then again, we don't really see substantive change for women. And I think like everywhere at the moment, Bristol is a city that's facing multiple problems of, around kind of economic equality, around safety, around you know issues around healthcare and out, um, equality outcomes. Um, all of this is you know the result of kind of 10, 12 years of austerity policies and the sort of eroding of women's economic equality and women's safety that is a result of austerity. And so it's really important now more than ever that we have really strong female leadership that isn't just saying, I exist as a woman, therefore I'm changing things for women. It's actually creating those substantive changes that mean women can you know, achieve that potential and achieve equality and, and liberation ultimately. Thank you. Darren, coming to you, um, one of the themes in our Festival of Future City in October is cities coming out of war and crisis. And in the book, of course, Bisnaga goes through a lot of, war and crisis. Um, you've written about this in your own work, particularly about um, Derry. Um, what lessons do you have for, for cities coming out of conflict and crisis, both on what you might have learned from this book, but also your own life and work? Well, um, I guess the, the message that comes out of this book for me uh, correlates with my own work, I think, in, in terms of the resistance to the singular, uh, the resistance to the people of one book. Um, you know, there's a plurality of stories all through Rushdie's work, uh, multiplicity of angles and perspectives and voices. And, um, and that's incredibly important, uh, but it needs to be real. It, it, it can't just become this, you know, we tend to have this tendency now of mantras about diversity and stuff, but 
actually live in that uh, can be more chaotic and messy than some people are, are ready for. And uh, getting delving into the messiness is, is, um, is vitally important and something that this book actually does very well, I think. It's, um, it's a very sophisticated book in a lot of ways. Um, you know, it begins with an incredible act of violence uh, with a, the sati ritual where, you know, women were compelled to throw themselves on the funeral pyres of, um, of their husbands and their, their superiors, supposedly, in society. And, um, and the, the, the way the book finds, the book isn't bound by that. The characters aren't bound by that. It's something that uh, they defy, and they defy by ignoring and building and creating uh, their own autonomy. And uh, so it begins from a very violent political or politicized act uh, of repression, but something emerges from it um, that is constructive. Um, and Rusty has, I, I think there's something very complex and sophisticated going on in Rusty's thinking, which is um, he's not reactionary, even in a, in a kind of progressive sense. You know, he doesn't, th there aren't these blank condemnations. He's much more subtle than that he's much more complex he's much more of a writer than that you know he's not it's not uh, a prolonged active activism it's a story first and foremost and he's first and foremost a storyteller and has always said that and uh you know for example with the actual act of sati itself the british empire came in and, and one of the ways that it appeared civilized was that it it uh it would ban these uncivilized practices you know so sort of by default, they look like the civilizing force when in fact they were, you know, coming into exact resources and, and repress the population. Um, and th there's elements of, of what you, I guess you would call sort of anti-colonial or post-colonial and all throughout Rusty's work and especially in this book. Um, you know, you touch on it with the bastardization even of the name in the Biznara. Um, but that's there's an interest in sort of he's always twisting things. He's always there's always a little quirk there. You know, Pampa actually likes the bastardization of the name because it's messy, because it's an, an accident, because it's sort of tangential, uh, because ultimately it resists the singular. And um, so while Rushdie defies, you know, it, all throughout his work, he defies the sort of the British uh imperial amnesia or you know the apologies that you you tend to find that there was some kind of golden age back then and you know we were bringing trains to India or whatever um he equally resists the sort of bjp and the nationalist approach which is th simultaneously it's singular as well um and he's always sort of he's looking for the plural the plurality and i think my experience you know growing up in a city that was divided uh, that had conflict and division just absolutely permeating every single aspect of it. The way that you, you, you naturally resisted it, it wasn't even a political polemic thing. Uh, it wasn't even a decision, really. It was just your, your natural impulse was to create spaces that defied that, create spaces that were different. And we literally did that in the space. You know, we when we were teenagers, we went up to rooftops because that was the one place that you couldn't be found by the RUC or the army or the IRA or whoever it happened to be. And you find these zones, autonomous spaces, and it doesn't even need to be political. It's just innate. It's just innate in human beings. If you can encourage them in a political way, if you can you know, find those spaces and, and expand them and develop them, then that's fantastic. But I think it's an innate human desire uh, to resist the singular. And Susie, coming to you, one of the themes of the book is the idea of refuge, getting away from a place and regrouping. And some cities are known for being places of refuge, both in the United States and uh, here, for example, of being cities of sanctuary. But, but tell us about the importance of refuge in the book. Well, I thought it was really interesting that there's a sort of chunk of the book where Pampa Campana, who's effectively created this city, uh, you know, given it life, imbued it with all her ideals, that she and her daughters effectively have to 
have to leave. And essentially it's, you know, it's with a battle for succession, if you like, and, and again, a battle between her, her daughters and her sons as to who should be uh, taking over in the city. And they withdraw um, very fast to, to a forest where they then spend, you know, decades in effective suspended animation. But this idea that sometimes you can't stand and fight, sometimes you have to withdraw and regroup uh, and find the space um, to protect yourself in order to be able to come back in this case. And obviously, Pampa Campana has her two and a half centuries of life, and so she's able to, to withdraw for a very long time and come back at a more auspicious moment. Um, with a with a sort of cloak of magic about her, sort of arriving back uh, in bird form, which then also makes her more acceptable. But I think one of the things that's interesting as well about this forest is that while it's a refuge and a refuge from the passage of time in some ways, there's also a whole lot going on in the background that we don't see much detail about. There's a huge battle with the pink monkeys, and there's a, you know there's a group of women in the forest who are living a, a purely feminist existence having escaped uh, from other places where um, women were less well treated if you like and I think it's a, sort of fascinating this idea that you're getting out of the city it's going and sitting in this forest in suspended animation as I say but I think it really does underline the importance of refuge and the fact that there are points where you can't stand and keep going with your message you know you you either have to shut down or you have to get out and find refuge uh, and, and that's clearly a very important point and it's something that we see as well um, in the debates around human rights in this country and other countries you know refugees asylum seekers are often at the sharp end of political narratives pushing back uh, on human rights and I think it, it, what we see in this book is how vital refuge is and whether you say as you say it's it's cities of refuge but also providing safe access to people providing safe access to people who are defending human rights uh safe access to people who are using their freedom of expression um and you know writers journalists and human rights defenders are often the people who are first most acutely in need uh, of refuge because often when we see um circumstances where societies are becoming extremely intolerant the first thing that will be clamped down on is freedom of expression because freedom of expression allows people to question authority it allows people to engage in discussion and when tolerance is fading if you like um people don't or, or those in power don't want to be questioned and they don't want to be engaging in informed uh, debate so refuge is really important both from the perspective of keeping freedom of expression, but also from keeping the memory, uh, keeping the memory and being able to come back and say what really happened um, in a space and to contribute to the future building of the city. I'm, I'm going to come back to memory and history, writing history moment. Sean, um, Bisnaga has a great uh, tradition of, in, in its tolerant times of arts and culture and poetry. Um, you've run festivals in Brussels. How important are these um, this, 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 the importance of arts and culture to cities. The more I read, for example, of cities coming out of the pandemic, the more reliance uh, is being placed on regenerating and renewing downtown areas in the United States, for example, with new arts and entertainment facilities. Absolutely. I mean, it's fundamental. I mean, one of the sort of things that makes living in a city worthwhile when it's you're living opposite a massive building site as I am now and it's constantly noisy and there's loads of traffic is is that you can tap into this great cultural heritage and that you can explore ideas and you can you know people come to cities to to build cultural entities be they theatres or cinemas or museums or create art exhibitions they're places of artistic community where people can find like-minded people and explore ideas and explore um, creative outlets. But I think it also taps really into what Susie was saying. You know, the reason we need these cultural spaces, we need cultural festivals, we need museums, we need galleries, we need gig venues is to promote that freedom of expression. You know, cities can be real centers of debate, of ideas, of idea making. And when we start to shut down those spaces, when we try and restrict um, our cultural heritage or try and, you know, close down, voices or close down 
spaces where people can think and share ideas and discuss and debate, we're in real trouble. And I think, you know, one of the really difficult things that many of us found living in lockdown was being cut off from cultural spaces, was not being able to congregate with people to share ideas and thoughts, was, you know, being kind of confined to our, our homes and our rooms and and not having that kind of openness of 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 access to creativity and access to to thinking. And, and it's interesting that coming out of the pandemic, there's on the one hand this real urge to get into these spaces, you know, festivals are reviving. Every festival that I've been to since the pandemic has been really buzzy and kind of this great relief that we're all together again. But also that cultural is again in the firing line from various governments. You know, we're seeing, you know, swinging cuts to, to cultural institutions and to festivals and to museums, um, the impact of the cost of living crisis on various cultural venues is really significant and yet very underreported. So last year I looked at the impact on museums, for example, which are seeing massive, massive energy bills um, go, and, you know, real problems in terms of making their budgets fit, while also losing out on funding that could have kept them afloat. And so I do kind of think that while there are, you know, the probably economic reasons for these cuts, they do fit into an attack on cultural freedom and freedom of expression that we're seeing much more widely. And I think we really need to treasure our cultural institutions and treasure these spaces, be that, you know, a collective, an artist collective, like that's formed out of a squat or, you know, a, a massive art gallery that's an in, a national, international institution. They all come from the same root of wanting to use cities and these space and, and communities to, to foster debate, to foster speech, and to have have that kind of freedom to explore and, and discover new ideas. You know, one of the big issues that we've seen over the last decade is the closure of libraries, for example. And these are spaces where, you know, I remember as a teenager going to the library every week. And the books that I read them have like had a profound influence on my life and my thinking. And so when we see these attacks on these spaces, we have to ask what's really being attacked. And I think there is this real problem that we have in in wanting to repress speech and wanting to repress freedom of expression and obviously that's something we need to fight back against. Darren you talked you mentioned earlier about Salman Rushdie's use of magical realism and mythology in his work how does this come through in in Victory City for you? Well, th there's an interesting aspect to, to magic realism it's it's a little bit like noir um, noir tends to noir films and and literature tends to happen in places um, where there's divisions and uh, people adopt shifting sort of identities as a as a means of survival essentially. And magic realism tends to su succeed best, I think, uh, or has done historically in places that have had uh, one overarching ideology that's dominated. Um, a, a kind of stifling orthodoxy, uh, authoritarianism. So it's a, it becomes a sort of way of resistance. Um, you see, you know, Central American magic, uh, sorry, South American magic realism, uh, Eastern European magic realism tends to happen in places where there's an inability to tell the truth because the truth um, will be severely punished. Um, so in a way, like we were talking earlier about sanctuary uh, language itself becomes a sanctuary and mythology you can you can kind of smuggle ideas and concepts and even the idea of freedom itself like almost like a trojan horse in these sort of magical packages um and rushdie has always been you know since midnight's children at least um has had a wonderful grasp of both mythological um and the sort of Flux of that and 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 the uh, the protein aspect of that the the, the way it can shape shift um, as a way of, of of transcending the binaries of politics and and that kind of stifling nature of of ideology and um, it's a very effective tool and it's a very underused tool I think um, and he's um, a master at it. Uh, there is something I, I came back to a speech uh, after when he was attacked. I, I came back to this speech that um, that he made, I think, at Columbia. And he 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 said, um, 
I'll quote him directly. Actually, he's he said, obviously a rigid, a rigid blinkered absolutist worldview is the easiest to keep hold of, whereas the fluid, uncertain, metamorphic picture I've always carried about is rather more vulnerable. Yet I must cling with all my might to my own soul. I must hold on to this mischievous, iconoclastic, out of step clown instincts, no matter how great the storm. And if that plunges me into contradiction and paradox, so be it. I've lived in that messy ocean all my life. I fished in it for my art. This turbulent sea was the sea outside my bedroom window in Bombay. It is the sea in which I was born and which I carry within me wherever I go. I kept coming back to that passage uh, and the sort of the joyful defiance of it. And I've heard it since, and he did an interview recently, and I think it was in the New Yorker podcast. And just the, the, the humor uh, in the face of this barbarity and the, the savagery of the attack and the cynicism of, of its apologists, the fact that he, his, he, he wasn't self-pitying, he wasn't calling for vengeance, uh, there was just this humor, instantly this defiant humor. And that's the spirit, it's that spirit uh, that is encapsulated in this book, is encapsulated in the best of Rusty's writing. And it's something that is encapsulated in magic realism, I think. Uh, you know, it tends to happen in places where it's not easy to speak the truth. Uh, so you have to find other means, other ways through the wall whether it's breaches or Trojan horses or whatever it might be. Susie, coming to you, in the book, various travellers come to Bisnaga and influence the place in, in many different ways. And th these are based on, on real people and, and, and real accounts of the time. And what, what role do they play for you here? Well, one of the things that I thought was fascinating was that the, the love interests in the book, such as there are any, are all foreigners. Effectively, Pampa Campana's um, love of her life is a series of interchangeable Italian and Portuguese visitors uh, to the city. Uh, and in fact, the first of those is um, seems to be the father of her daughters. And one of the things that I thought was interesting in the discussion about succession was that it was sort of pitched as the girls against the boys. But one of the other aspects of those children of potential succession is that all the girls were potentially fathered by a foreigner who was Pampa Campana's love. So there's this sort of interesting question of tolerance where at the beginning of the book, she keeps her, her foreign lover while also being married to the king. But then when it comes to succession, clearly that's a very different uh, matter. And we see later on as well, one of her daughters who you know is, is drawn by the lure of travel and who disappears with a, with a Chinese traveller. So you see that these travellers do have a sort of profound impact, but they also in some ways tread lightly on the city itself of Bisnaga. So they have very personal impacts on Pampa Campana and on her family. But it's also interesting that there's a, a sort of foreigner's neighbourhood in Bisnaga. So they're very separate while they're also... Uh, very much accepted by her. And I thought that idea as well of travel, of maps, and when we see her great, great, great granddaughter uh, returning, who's absolutely driven by this idea of travel and who draws the maps that she has heard through, throughout her life and through her uh, family history when she eventually returns to Bisnaga. And so we see this idea that, you know, a city can't be standing on its own this sort of no man is an island no city is an island if you like and that you need the external influences uh, throughout your history in order for a society to grow but also flagging uh, the problematic nature of that and I think particularly in this book you know it's the women who are bringing in foreign men uh, and the sort of challenges that that then raises with you know there's some casual racism at the, the later end of the book uh, in relation to that, but also the challenge, as I say, about succession and rulership um, in the city, which I thought was very interesting, the way that sort of was a thread through the book, but also not an entirely prominent uh, and um, necessarily explained thread through the book. Thank you. Sean, can I ask you about storytelling and the writing of history? Um, in, in At the beginning of, of Bisnaga, 
Pampa Campana literally makes up, well, she makes the city up from seeds, but um, makes up the stories of the people who live there, give them a history, and then they develop and get their own histories and so on. And then later on, um, Rushdie writes that history is the consequence not only of people's actions, but also of their forgetfulness. So it's about writing, it's about people understanding their place, where they've come from, their history, but also what they forget as well as what they remember. Absolutely. And I think this is a really on topic point that we're seeing in terms of who gets to write history at the moment and who gets to forget and who's entitled to certain narratives. So the first thing I wanted to say about the storytelling aspect is, as you say, Pampa Campana like, whispers these narratives into people's minds and it becomes their memories. And that's how the history of the city is built almost from a moment. Um, and I think one of the joys of living in a city is, is that when you, you're in a city, you're not really there for the buildings or the roads. It, it's the histories, it's the hidden stories that occupies all of those spaces. It's when you walk past a pub and it's like, oh, that's the pub. It's one in Soho that my friend always points out to me. That's the pub that Marx used to, was drinking in before he wrote the Communist Manifesto. <laughs> you walk through Bristol and you go past the house that was in the David Olashuga show and you remember all of the stories that were, were, were nurtured and created in that house. And so, yes, cities are buildings, their plans, their, their maps, their roads, their pavements, but they're also the stories of the people that have inhabited them. And I think one of you know the joys of living in a city is discovering those stories and finding those surprising things, seeing that odd blue plaque or that odd little plaque that isn't a, an official blue plaque at all, but that someone has just put there, or the um, Spanish Civil War Memorial in Castle Park, which I must have lived in Bristol for probably 25 years before I even spotted that. And suddenly all of these narratives arrive in your mind and you, and this acts of imagination when you try and think about what it was like to to live in that time and to to be the people that went out off to war and, and are remembered in this way but the other aspect of that of course is who gets to control these stories and who gets to forget and one of the the big sort of debates that we're having around history at the moment and particularly the history of cities is of course around um issues of race of empire of the enslavement of people and this absolute desire by some um, people on the sort of right of politics to say that there is only one version of history and we have to forget the other versions. And that version is of British supremacy, that the empire may have done some bad things, but was probably good because we built the roads. And that, you know, we, we shouldn't be focusing on, on the negatives or we shouldn't be focusing on the harms that people did. We should just be focusing on the great narrative. And that is an incredible act of forgetting. It's an absolute deliberate act of forgetting to say that there is only one version of events that we must all adhere to. And to not adhere to that is somehow unpatriotic or is somehow a betrayal of British values. And I think what's been really interesting is that the, the resistance to that is an act of remembrance. It's remembering that there are alternative narratives. It's remembering the harms that were done. It's recognizing that things were complicated and that people were hurt and people were oppressed and people were exploited in order to create this one grand narrative of history. And so I think it really goes back to that quote that Darren said earlier from Rushdie, you know, there, there can be this singular, there can be this singular narrative that we all adhere to. And there can be the multifaceted, ex the, the messiness, the, 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 the choppy waters of, of, of stories that we have to explore and we have to examine and we have to be honest about. And um, I guess the final thing that I wanted to say is that with this, this kind of insistence on the one narrative of history, there is a, a, a contradiction at its heart because it's the criticism coming from that one narrative's um, voice is that it's the opposite opposition that is causing the problem that is forgetting the good and only focusing on the bad but actually it's it's the complete opposite of that there's there's a refusal to recognize the complexity of stories the complexity of history and the diversity of stories and experiences and that's the act of forgetting not the decision to amplify those stories to amplify those narratives and amplify that diversity and so I think when Pampa, Campana whispers those stories it's like who gets to decide what history looks like, who gets to tell the stories and how do they change and how do they evolve and who gets to forget and who gets to be amplified. And another theme in Festival of the Future City, which is following a number of years of work on this, is about how cities remember the past and how they use that past to create a understand where they are now, but also create a better future. Um, Quick question for Darren and Susie. Sean talked a bit there about what she likes about being in cities. What What would you say, just some quick thoughts? I'll, I'll start with you, Darren. Oh, um, 
very similar actually. Uh, the ex exploration quality to it, the the fact that the the, fam the familiar often conceals the extraordinary. You know, once you start digging anywhere, I like finding. I like going to places, you know, that are off the beaten track and where there appears to be no history, and um, and and invariably anywhere human beings have spent time. You just you just dig and it's there. You know, like literally, you know, geographically or topographically, you'll find you know nettles grow where there used to be ruins. You know. Like when when the river has a drought, things start to appear, you know. So I, I like uh, going off the beaten track and finding places in London. I, I live in London now, um, and it's just been an endless excavation of place. Um, and those are all tied to people and often layers of people, layers of time. So it's that idea of the strata just digging in and uh, it just makes life interesting. You know, we, we tend to fall into dull routines of work and profit and commerce and, and all the rest. And they have a sort of dulling effect on life. And uh, one of the ways of reviving is, is to be able to walk, walk around on your familiar route to work. I, I commit to Soho every day. And, uh, and it's easy to just fall in, you know, pack like sardines in a can in the tube and sent off in the morning. But uh, I force myself, at, you know, at lunchtime to go off and this, take the side streets and the things you find there and the people you find there um, very often change the way you see the place. You, you think you know a place until you, until you start digging. It's a wonderful place to explore. I love exploring that area. Susie, what about you? I love the diversity, to be honest. I mean, and I grew up, you know, on a farm outside a small village on a small island, and now I'm a Londoner. Um, and I think like most Londoners, you know, I, I've adopted the city because I love it, because I love being in the city. I mean, I also love the countryside, but that diversity in London, I remember when I first moved to London, and I never thought I would move to London. I, I was quite allergic to the idea of moving to London because I had this idea of this massive metropolis that you just get lost in. Um, and I remember going on the tube and sort of hearing so many different languages and seeing so many different people, so many different um, outfits, if you like. You, you know, you're you're in so many different worlds, just going five stops on the on the London Underground. That I felt quite exhausted, having always lived in quite small um, cities uh, and small villages. Um, but suddenly, once I got over that initial shock of the barrage of, of, sort of information that you get when you arrive in London, it's something I enormously miss whenever I'm out of London, uh, and which always brings me back um, to to such a cosmopolitan city. I love the, the cosmopolitan nature, but also that trail through history, as you're saying, the fact that you're, you've got an absolute clash of modernity and history. And you can be seeing the most cutting edge architecture in the city of London and walk around the corner and be plunged back into you know, Georgian Britain and get memories of, of the people that lived there uh, in the past. So for me, it's the cosmopolitanism, it's the diversity, it's the fact that whoever you are, you can find your people in a city like, like London. Thank you. And um, one final quick question to you all. Do you have... Uh, anything more you'd like to say about Salman's work? Any message you'd like to give Salman or Sean? I think it's just really important at this time of where we are seeing this backlash against freedoms and fundamental freedoms to really value the storytellers who push push against that and who demand that voices and diversity of voices are platformed. I think my work is really focused on the far right and the you know absolute repression of freedom of speech that the far right demands in all sorts of ways while defending that repression as an act of freedom of speech you know they argue that their speech is being repressed by the the lefty liberal lovies like me um or that their freedoms to to hate their freedoms to to be harmful are being repressed and I think we need to absolutely champion what we mean by freedom of speech, what freedom of speech has the power to do and to change. And a writer like Salman Rushdie does that. We can't let these kind of regressive forces 
co-opt that message and co-opt that freedom in order to push a hateful agenda we absolutely have to celebrate those who are really fighting for what it means and fighting for those greater freedoms for all of us thank you susie I think I'd really just like to say thank you um, for the work. And for me, it's been something that's gone with me through my life. I mean, I remember uh, the Satanic Verses coming out. I think that was the first Rushdie novel that I read and just being blown away with the richness of the worlds that he uh, creates. Uh, and having read him you know, throughout my life, it's wonderful uh, to read Victory City, to have the opportunity to take part in this conversation particularly at such a difficult time. And I'd really just like to thank him for his bravery in, in keeping going in the fact that he's still creating, that he's still laughing, and that he's still producing these, these fabulous worlds uh, that we can enjoy. Uh, and Darren? I think there can be a, a kind of pious quality to books and anybody who's spent any time in the publishing industry knows that it can be as dishonorable as any industry really. Um, but I feel like Rushdie with his bravery and his imagination and the kind of defiance of his joy uh, honors books again um, and it needs honoring periodically and uh, he really, really does that. And I think there's, there, there's a quote, I think it's Ursula Le Guin said that the land outlives the empire. And, and with Rushdie, um, I, get, I get the feeling that it's like the story outlives the tyrant. He's living proof of that. Well, thank you very much. Victory City is published by Jonathan Cape and it's out now. Thank you very much, Sean, Darren and Susie for joining me today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.